Good morning. Good morning. As a Christian university, we recognize that we are a people who are formed by a story. Our story at Seattle Pacific is tied to the land that this campus is built on, a land that holds rich and far too often forgotten histories. Seattle Pacific University is named for a city that takes its name from Chief Sayal, the chief of the Duwamish people, whose territory and traditional land stretched across our campus. We respectfully acknowledge with gratitude that we are gathering today on the lands, both seated and unseated, of the Coast Salish peoples, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, people who are still here today. We recognize that a statement without action is not enough. As a community who strives to love God and neighbor, we repent of the ways that we have participated in harm. We commit to reconciliation and repair with the Coast Salish peoples as we continue to learn and care for the land. With that in mind, I welcome you to the proceedings today. This year marks the 21st annual Day of Common Learning at Seattle Pacific University, a day we set aside each year to engage in deep thoughts and conversations around a topic of interest and concern. The Day of Common Learning is set apart for us to come together as a community and to critically engage in topics that are important to us as learners, scholars, and followers of Christ. We take this day to create a space for contemplation, fruitful discussions, and engaging conversations. Our theme this year is art and atonement, expressing, expressing truth and justice. Art, whether sculpture, music, painting, woodworking, graphic design, theater, poetry, storytelling, dance, or another form of expressing feelings and thoughts. Art can provide us with a sense of wonder, a sense of comfort, and a sense of peace. Art can also challenge us to consider new ways of thinking and can help us look at issues differently. Art invites us to encounter a deeper connection with the world and can encourage a deeper relationship with one another and with God. Today, as we hear from our keynote speaker, Lo Alleman, a spoken word poet, and then this afternoon, as we participate in various breakout sessions, highlighting theater, visual art, and narratives, I trust we will find God speaking to us. Later this evening, I hope you will join in the open mic night to express your thoughts and ideas about atonement through art, music, and prose. I urge you to open your hearts and allow your encounters with art to reconcile you and bring you closer to each other and to God. I trust you will be intellectually and spiritually enriched by today's offerings. Thank you for joining us as we consider how we can express truth and justice through art. And now I'd like to invite Provost Laura Hartley to the stage to introduce our speaker. Good morning, and thank you, Caroline, for all your work in putting this day together. We uh, appreciate it, and we are grateful to be able to gather together as a, a community, a community of faculty, staff, and students. We, we rarely have the opportunity to all be in the space together, so this is a wonderful day, and we're so glad that you've chosen to join us. It truly is an honor for me to introduce to you our keynote speaker um, of the day, Lauren Aleman, AKA Lo the Poet. Lo is a nationally known spoken word artist, author, speaker, and minister. In preparing for this introduction, I was able, through the memory of the internet, to read several interviews he's given over the past few years, where I was fascinated to learn about the origins of his faith and vocation. Here's a few things I learned. 
In his early life in Los Angeles, California, Lowe was introduced to rap music and culture and aspired to be a rapper. In seventh grade, he moved to a small town in Mississippi where he says he experienced culture shock and in his own words was put off by how Christian everybody was and the fact that church attendance was a mandatory part of life. As a first year college student, he rejected faith and was more interested in partying than academics. That is not a, 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 a example to follow students. <laughs> that fact landed him in summer school after his first year, where he found himself on campus with, quote, a bunch of weird kids, a group of whom also happened to be followers of Jesus. And they were also artists who started mentoring him, pouring him into him, and helping him see that Jesus could heal his pain, redeem his life, and use him for God's glory. He turned from rap music to poetry and began to share his gifts from the stage through spoken word opportunities. He says that he was horrible at first, but he kept doing it and fine-tuning, and the first time he shared a poem about what God was doing in his life, the reaction he got was amazing he began to realize that he could minister to others through poetry. In December 2015, Lowe married Erica, his high school sweetheart, and a poem that he wrote for her and shared as she walked down the aisle turned into a viral video that garnered more than 17 million views on YouTube and Facebook. It's beautiful, you should look it up, but not right now. In 2017, Lowe and Erica moved to Texas where he began working in college ministry while Erica attended grad school. In early 2020, they moved again, and Lowe found himself in a new community, serving as the community life minister in a predominantly white church, just as the COVID pandemic began to impact all of our lives. That was also the time when the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, then Breonna Taylor, and then George Floyd, brought to national attention issues of racial justice. In the preface of his book, we sang a dirge, poems, laments, and other things that matter from God, which was published in 2020. Lowe describes how he found himself at that time invited uh, to participate in numerous Zoom panels and podcasts talking about race. He says he was, he was happy to jump into these conversations because, quote, for years I'd been heartbroken by the church's silence on issues of racial injustice and its complacency with homogeneity and worship. I'd been studying, praying, and waiting for a time when Christians would be ready to deal with this division in our culture, or at least address where it exists in our congregations. He continues, one day I was on a call with a group of older white men in my church. They'd asked me to come and share my experience with them as a black man in America. Fortunately for them, I'd spent the last several months sharing my perspectives on the racial tension in our cultural moment and how I think Jesus is calling us to respond to it. Fortunately for me, that's not what they were interested in. Thanks for the history lesson, but we were wanting to know how you feel. And just like that, I realized that I'd been sweeping my own feelings under the rug this whole time. Lowe goes on to say that our culture is in a moment where we are spending a lot of time and energy arguing with one another, using perspectives and facts. And then he describes this realization. He says, I was trying to let information do a job that only compassion could do. I love that. Through his poetry, Lowe is able to bring forward the experiences of brothers and sisters from marginalized communities, and he invites us to empathize with their experiences, whether they are similar to or very different from our own. In another interview, he put it this way, there's a huge need for the church to respond to the scriptural call for oneness, not sameness. Oneness looks like, if you're grieving, I agree with you. We don't even have to have the same problems. We don't even have to have the same opinions about those problems or the same opinions about the solutions. But if we're one, then your burdens are my burdens and we bear one another's burdens, like Galatians 6 2, right? As we explore today's theme of art and atonement, will you please join me in welcoming to Seattle Pacific University, Lo the Poet, as he comes to share with us on Missing Piece of the Masterpiece, Finding Ourselves in the Atoning Work of God. Yo, that's um, that's some good stalking right there. That's all that is. 
exploring the internet. That's uh, that, that's weird. <laughs> I don't even think some of that stuff's on the internet. You, you called my mom. That's kind of crazy. That's dope. Uh, SPU, good morning. Awesome. I feel like there's more of y'all in here than who responded to that good morning. Uh, and I'm a black preacher from Mississippi, so y'all gotta talk to me this whole time. Uh, Travis again, SPU, good morning. Hey, there we go. I'm super excited to be here with y'all. Uh, in all of those introductions, I am like a creative and a poet and a preacher and all that stuff. I'm also like kind of a thug. And that's a real thing. Uh, I love Jesus a lot. Uh, I have a beautiful chocolate wife. All that stuff's true. Um, all that's good. Like the, the, the part that I want to emphasize that she mentioned, though, is like I, I said no to the whole cultural Christian thing. Uh, when I was sitting in y'all seats uh, as a freshman in college, my mom just was not there to make me go. So I didn't. And I was really good at the partying thing. Not an example to live by, but if you have questions, I'm <laughs> here for it. Um, so it, it was an interesting time, right? Uh, had an interaction with the Holy Spirit that I cannot make sense of outside of God being real and being interested in my life for some reason. And in that experience, all the argument, all the information, all of the theological debating I found myself in, I, just, I could not argue a God reaching out to me. It made no sense. Uh, because you guys are in a similar place, a similar stage of life, I just have so much joy and excitement for being here with you guys. Because I think the Holy Spirit wants to do that same thing, uh, to speak to hearts, um, not to win arguments, not to win over opinions, really just to tell you who he thinks you are. Uh, and to show much of who his son is. And so I'm excited to hang with you guys. I'm going to pray for us, and we're jumping straight in. Sound good? Fire. Abba, thanks for loving us. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you for the opportunity to share in your goodness and your word and your truth. I pray you make much of yourself and make much of our time. Bless here, Jesus. We talk about what it means to be atoned, what atonement is, and the length of which you went to go to that we might be atoned in you. So you let me pray? Amen. Awesome. All right, I can't see this screen, so I'm going to trust you guys to help me navigate. What is on the screen right now? Thanks. <laughs> awesome. So, so that's, the, that's the title of, of my presentation. The whole theme here is this Art of Atonement vibe. If you guys aren't familiar, the word atonement from a Christian lens is basically the reconciliation between God and humankind. That something put our relationship with God at odds with each other. And God wants to restore, renew, reconcile that relationship. And reconcile just means bring it back to what it was supposed to be. If at once we were supposed to belong to God, he wants that to be a thing. If we were supposed to be in relationship with God, he wants that to be a thing. If he wants to walk with us in an Edenic type of garden, a place where there's nothing but delight and joy and pleasure in him, that's what he wants to get back to. For us to begin to belong to him again should mean that we start to look like he owns us. We want him to own us, our hearts, our homes, our churches, our colleges, our cities, our world. The best thing we think could happen for this world is if Jesus owns it again. So that's our heart. So we're praying for what we're after. But for him to own it means it starts to look different, maybe different than what we expect. So I, I've since day one been preaching from a tablet. I like to preach from a tablet because it's not like a phone. It's kind of ghetto. Um, and it's not like a computer, which is like real serious and stuff. And so I've been doing this whole tablet preaching thing my entirety of ministry. And then I had kids and Disney Plus came out with an app. <laughs> and my children know how to put apps on my phone. So now it's not my tablet, it's our tablet. And I, I, I hear my tablet sounds different. It sounds like Bluey and, and, and Paw Patrol. And it looks different. I had a tablet that was beautiful and neat, and now it's cracked because my son dropped it in the kitchen floor. It's bedazzled because my, my daughter got a hold of it. You know how hard it is to, to tell people that I'm, I'm really a thug up here with a glittery unicorn on my tablet? It's difficult. Like, I, I, I wish I was joking. This is not my work. This is all her. But because now we co-own it, it looks different. If Jesus were to really own this campus, if you were to own your education, if you were to own your career, if you were to own your family, I'd imagine it would be decorated a little bit differently than if you had your own hands to it. The invitation is for him to reconcile us to himself, which means us being honest with the places that we don't want him to rule. We don't want him to change things. We don't want him to move. In it. And yet we have this weird faith that tethers us together that says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Reconcile us back to yourself. 
bring our hearts and our minds and our attentions back to you. There's a masterful work that Jesus is up to in the world of reconciling. And I would say it's very artistic. It's divinely expressing the heart and the intention of God. It's divinely expressing God's want for our lives. It's beautiful. It's artsy. It's fantastic. But there are some missing pieces there. Mainly the pieces that we don't want to see. One of those is that if God's at work, if God gets the last say, if God reconciles us back to himself, there's some parts of us that we are comfortable with that he's going to want to change. There's some parts of our communities and how we gather and how we identify that he's going to want to change. And, and it's not plans to harm us, but to give us hope and a good and expected end. I talk a lot about my family, so I figured I'd show you what they look like. So this is my chocolate bunch right here. Uh, I'm the dude with the shiny white teeth. Uh, all that's photoshopped. Uh, beautiful woman next to me is my wife, Erica. Uh, she is holding our son, Maverick. Y'all say, hey, Maverick. He can't hear you. And I, uh, I'm holding my daughter, Emerson. Emerson is, she'll be four in March. She is an absolute gift and a light uh, and a bit of a hot mess all at the same time. Uh, beautiful kid. We, we figured the best thing that we could do in honoring the gift that God has given us and our children, to steward them well, is to show them what it means to live a life postured after the heart of the Father, to be a functioning adult. It's an act of grace to change diapers. It really is. It's an even bigger act of grace to teach you how to wipe that stuff yourself. And so we are in a season of potty training our children. Uh, math could care less. Emmy's kind of getting the hang of it. We use this really interesting tool called bribery to get our child uh, to figure this out. So we have a system at the house. Every time she successfully pees in the potty, she gets a lollipop. Every time she successfully poops in the potty, she gets a donut. <laughs> this has been the most crapping little girl I've ever seen <laughs> my entire life. I'm talking about letting it go. Like she is she is in there consistently because she gets it. Every time I do this thing, I get a reward. Like we've been so faithful to pooping in the potty. The people at the donut shop see us pulling up and they know what time it is. <laughs> they're ready to go. We walk in and stop and they're like, oh, who did it? And I'm like, she did. <laughs> Give us the donuts. She's all about it. So a couple months go by, we're, we're kind of killing this whole potty training thing. She's like throwing all the pull-ups away. She's ready for donut time. And when she goes to the bathroom, and as she goes to the bathroom, she, uh, she comes out and she looks like super sad, like super dejected. And I'm like, baby, what's wrong? She says, I can't poop. I'm like, because you're chock full of donuts. <laughs> it's all right, give it some time, eat a pear, go running, you'll be good. And, and I thought she was like being silly, but she's like mad hysterical, super upset. I cannot calm her down. I'm like, yo, we can go get some donuts right now, chill out. But she was really sad. And over time, we had to like figure out this like rhythm was happening to where our kid, not by our choice, not by our intentionality, it just happened. Our kid was de deriving a narrative from the things that were happening in our life. She had decided, or at least deduced, that when I can do this thing, I'm worth celebrating. And when I cannot give what I literally do not have to give, I'm somehow less worth celebrating. And daddy's less proud of me when I can't do the thing but I can't give what I don't have. She pulled a narrative out of an experience that was shaping her. And so we had to change what we were doing. We had to say, okay, well, maybe we're just gonna celebrate when we can wash our hands. We can always do that. Or we'll celebrate when we go try. But it wasn't intentional how this happened. It just kind of happens. The experiences of our lives create narratives. And then we start to base assumptions about the world that we live in, about the people that we are, about God based upon the narratives we pull from these experiences. Jesus says it like this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. What you see adds light or darkness to your body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, or if you have an unhealthy lens that you're seeing the world through, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The lens that you see the world through is important. It, it shapes you. It, it challenges you. It, it, it starts to determine how you view yourself and how you view the people around you and how you view God. I think there's a big, missing, glaring piece of what we look at as the gospel. We tend to make it a story all about Jesus. 
and all about how good God is, and how amazing and worthy of praise God is. And that's certainly a part of the story, but it's missing a piece. We tend to focus on performance and morality and ethic, and that's definitely a part of the story, but it's, it's missing a piece. There's a masterful work in what God is doing in the church and the local body, but that's not the fullness of the work. It's missing a piece. The point of a story is not how much can we do for God. The point of a story is not if I do this thing, then God will love me. That's some ways we kind of derive and deduce how God is doing, but I would argue that's not what Scripture is. It's not even a rule book. Fun fact, just in case you guys were curious, 502 chapters of the Bible. If you open your Bible right now, 502 chapters, which is roughly 44% of the Bible. So almost half is a narrative. It's a work of art. God telling a story, masterfully weaving a story together. It's not a rule book. It's a story. 33% of your Bible, 387 chapters. It's all poetry. Meaning God not just want to tell you know something. He wants to engage in your emotion and your imagination. That's what poetry does. He's not just saying obey this and do this and do that. I want to engage in how you feel. I want to shape how you dream. I want to shape how you see the world creatively. Half of it's a story. A third of it is poetry. 24% is what we would call discourse or, or speeches or, or letters. And there's some instruction in there. But all of these are couched in the context of relationship, covenantal commandment. So, yeah, God wants to tell you a story. God wants to invite you to thinking creatively about the world you live in and who he sees you and how you see him. And he wants to tell you some things that are instructional for your life, but also always, always in the form of a relationship, like a friend would write a letter to a friend. It's much less about how do I do the right thing for God. Much more, God is giving us this beautiful gift of art to see who he is and who he thinks we are and what kind of relationship he's inviting us to. It's very important that we catch this part of the story, that God is doing a lot less of commanding and much more of expressing something, expressing his heart, expressing his truth. Jesus being the word of God, the logos, that's, that's the expression of who God is. Hebrews says he is the full expression of God, not just the commandments of God, but the expression of God's heart and character, the very nature of God is expressing something. And he wants to make sure we see it, that we don't have weak and broken eyes. Because if we miss parts of the story, it'll shape the story completely. I think that Twitter is a very interesting space. Very few good things happen on Twitter. However, uh, I, I found this interesting thing. It's a hashtag called bad movie reviews. Basically, people are describing movies, emphasizing a certain part of the story and totally missing what the story is. Uh, so here's one for Frozen. This is a, a weird synopsis. After the death of her parents, a young socialite causes millions in property damage. <laughs> That's an interesting summary of Frozen. Does that happen in the story? Yes. She'd be jacking all kind of stuff up. Yes. Is that the point of the story? Not at all. <laughs> here's another one. Star Wars. Father reunites with a long lost son and wants him to take over the family business. Is that in the story? Yeah. Is it the point of the story? Please tell me y'all have seen Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> it's a thing. There's a lot of them. You should watch them. At least one. Um, here's another one. It's probably my favorite one. Um, <laughs> you've seen this one, apparently. <laughs> Does this happen in the story? Yes, poor Ron, poor Harry. It happens in the story. Is it the point of the story? No. Uh, for all my OG uh, Tolkien fans, group spends nine hours returning jewelry. <laughs> Definitely in the story. Definitely a part. Is it the point? No. And we can say this jokingly, but like, there are some really weird things. If we overemphasize certain parts, we can miss the point. If you overemphasize a part of the story, you can completely miss what God's up to. Give me an example. Financial security. It's important. We all would agree that, right? A lot of underserved communities, a lot of minority communities, 
A lot of communities that have been on the wrong side of some really broken injustices would argue, we like financial security, we'd love some of that. We don't just want you to honor us with your words. Financial security is important. But if we're not careful, if we make that part of the story, the point of the story, we'll have a weird lens that we look at the world through. We'll start to think, well, I have to make sure that I'm financially stable before I do what God's called me to do. Or uh, I have more money in my account than that person, I'm somehow more important or more valid. Or this opportunity will pay me more. Surely that's God's will for my life. If that's the lens you start to look through, it'll lead you to some weird conclusions that's not God's heart. If you overemphasize a part and you make it the point. I'll give you another one, education. Education is important, right? Statistically adds value to people's lives. But if we make that part of the truth, the point of our lives, say very weird, similar things. I'm more educated than them, so I know better. I'm more valid. These communities don't have as much access to education, so somehow they're less than. Somehow they're not as worthy of God's heart, not as worthy of opportunities. Some people have some weird opinions about who God is and how they think he sees the world because they've overemphasized certain parts of the story. Is God, is God about justice? Please say yes. Yes, God is a, he's a just God. But is justice the point of the story? I'd argue no. When you make God just a just God, and he becomes this fire and brimstone old dude of a God. He's like Gandalf if you're white. <laughs> Morgan Freeman if you're black. <laughs> He's this old, angry, constipated kind of dude who just wants to correct stuff and get it right and fix it. And he's all about just, that, If that's the only point of God, it makes things like the Garden of Eden weird. Because it seems like the point is just delighting and spending time with his children. What does God do if there's nothing to fix? Before sin into the story, was he aimlessly just wandering about? Justice is important. It's not the whole of the story. Does God bless? Yes, right? Blessing is a huge part of the story. Is that all the story is about? Is God a cosmic vending machine that just gives me whatever I want when I put the right amount of prayers in? No, God is all, he, he blesses for sure. That's not all that he's about. Sometimes he tells me no. Sometimes he disagrees with me. Sometimes how I define what's best for the world is not what he thinks is best for the world. Sometimes he does not bless what I want him to bless. Sometimes he refuses me things that I think are good for me. And later on I find out he just knows better. It's actually good that that wasn't how, how it was supposed to go. The point of the story in Scripture, you can trace this all the way from Genesis to Revelation, is communion. That God wants to be with his people. That he's a father that's inclined towards his people. The, the, the cry that's going to echo throughout heaven when we all get there is, look how good it is. The dwelling of God is amongst men again. That he wants to be present. Jesus came and tabernacled with us, dwelt among us. It's the gift of the incarnation. That what was lost, what we lost in the fall is being reconciled. He brings us back to good relationship with him. I don't just want Jesus' stuff. The point is being with Jesus. We don't want God's justice of his kingdom without the king actually being there to, to execute that justice. We have to make sure we see with healthy eyes. But what are you up to? How do you define this? Art has a beautiful way of rerouting our vision helping us to see who God is in the story, and then helping us to find ourselves in the atoning work of God as well. What a lot of us want to do is to say, God's doing something good. Go be great, Jesus. Yay, you. And more often than not, what God does in the story is he invites you to find yourself in the story, to play a part, to have a heart that beats for the things that God's heart beats for, the people that God wants us to serve people that God wants us to be. What I would argue is that we need prophecy, eyes that see. Now, prophecy is not saying like some weird voodoo stuff. In Scripture, prophecy just means you see the same way God sees. Read 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. The prophets of the days were called seers. They had divine perspective. Paul gives his same prayer in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I pray that you would prophesy, that you would see with God's perspective. And one of the ways that God does that, almost half the Bible, he shows you an artistic story. 
A third of the Bible, he gives you beautiful poetry. Find yourself here, dream here, imagine here. He does give instruction, but like a friend talks to a friend. Find yourself here in the story. You and I live in something called a, a post-Christian culture. It's a society that's not ignorant of the things of Jesus. It's just, it's anti a lot of the things of Jesus. And that happens a number of ways. If we keep this same energy, we would say well, a post-Christian culture is just a culture that does not see things the way that God sees them. It has a different perspective than what God has. And it's not always ignorant to it. It just means it doesn't agree with it. More often than not, somebody has had a a harsher perspective, a broken view of who Jesus is, and they are lashing out against that view. And honestly, it's, it's a view that I don't always like. I, I don't know if I would serve or want to serve constipated Gandalf God. If that's who he is, cool. But it doesn't seem to be his nature. It doesn't seem to be his way. A lot of people have a different area they can kind of view this in. I, I work in a lot of arts communities and creative communities in Houston. And we have a community of creatives here in the, or there in the city. And what we do is we gather together and we find creative ways to worship and creative ways to invite people and creative ways to do community together. We're a team of tattoo artists, poets, rappers, break dancers, uh, and one guy that does taxes. It's really weird. Uh, <laughs> but he's creative. We need him. And so our, our team... Our, our team gets together, and what we noticed was there's, there's a way in which we identified as artists and as creatives in our own circles and spheres. It was awesome. But we also recognized that the creative community in Houston is very anti-religion, very anti-faith, very anti-Jesus. Because many of them have been hurt by the church, hurt by God's people. Someone had carried a very ugly version of God to, but now that's what they see. It shaped their vision of who God was and who God's people can be in a negative way. So we try to figure out how do we help reconcile this? How do we show a better vision of God? You guys, I'd imagine, have operated in some societies and communities that aren't always pro-Jesus because someone's probably had a negative view. I know for sure this happens in education, particularly uh, in psychology. So there was a, a thing that got really, really popular in the 90s and early 2000s, Maslow's Hierarchy of Need. You guys heard that before? It's a little pyramid joint. At the base of it, it says we all have our basic needs, right? So we have to worry about food and water and shelter. It's very important because if you can't have those things, then you can't add on to those self-fulfillment needs. And self-fulfillment needs look like social connection and look like uh, living for uh, affluence and approval and praise of people. And outside of that, you have psychological needs, the need for self-esteem, something to think highly of you. And then after that, you can think of other people. So you have to have basic needs, then these needs, then these needs. And at the end of all of that, worrying about yourself, then you can worry about other folks, which is coincidentally the opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Seek first the kingdom and all that other stuff will be added unto you. So on one level, it can seem like psychology is coincidentally at odds with the teachings of Jesus. But if you explore where this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of need comes from, you find something really interesting. So he wrote this essay, 1943. To read the essay, there's a quote there. He says, it is quite true that man lives by bread alone. If you're familiar with the Bible, that's a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter eight. He's not ignorant of scripture, he knows it. He's basing his entire hypothesis about the opposite of the teachings of God. Explore a little bit about his life. He was raised by a single mom, an Orthodox Jew, and she was emotionally and verbally abusive towards him. And she would hurl scripture like insults at him, weaponize it against him. And so he sees an angry vision, an angry perspective of who God is. He's influenced away from it. So then when he gains influence and he's able to show up for people and able to influence them, he also wants to influence them away from Jesus. It's not coincidentally that he doesn't know who Jesus is. He's just seen a really ugly version of somebody's perspective on who Jesus is. And I get why he's at odds with it. There are many spaces that we operate in that are in this post-Christian kind of culture. And all they need is not just to argue, to debate, to show how right we are. They need their vision reconciled to see Jesus as he actually is, as he presents himself in the story. 
to see the stories Jesus tells about himself and the stories he tells about them, to reroute their vision, to show up as he actually is. This is not just something that Jesus wants to have happen. This is what the world actually wants to have happen. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 19. It says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. It's waiting for that missing piece to finally show up in the masterpiece. What is it waiting on? For you and I, for the children of God to find themselves in the story. That you are dearly loved by the Father. But you're a son more than you're a performer. You're a daughter more than you are your wants. You, you, you're, you're, you're not limited to what the world says about you, what your flesh says about you, what culture says about you, what they, whoever they is, says about you. You're exactly who God calls you. And creation wants this. When Jesus is baptized, he comes out of the water and the sky rips open. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And God says, this is my son whom I love, who I'm well pleased with. That's what God says over you. And that creation is waiting for you to hear those words. You are God's beloved, who he is for, who he desires, who he's pleased with. There can be no conversation about God's justice without seeing what God's heart is. And God's heart is for communion. That the most just thing that can happen in our world, the biggest and greatest atoning work that can happen, is that those with power would see those without through the lens of Jesus. Those in positions of authority would see those without through the lens of Jesus. Those who were in lower positions would begin to see themselves through the lens of Jesus. Those who were in higher positions and those who were in lower positions, wherever they are, they would see themselves and each other through the lens of Jesus. It starts with this atoning work. Jesus actually tells the story a lot. He was a bunch of blind people, tell the same story over and over again, and invite people to find themselves in this story. Luke chapter 15 is a good example. There are tax collectors that are there, and there are sinners that are there, people who are opposed to each other. There's divisiveness between these relationships. Tax collectors and sinners are all hanging around. They're all wanting to hear Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were also there. They're muttering, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Religious folks are there too, always saying something weird. So they're all in the mix together. And the last line in verse 3 says, Jesus began to tell them parables, which is another way of saying he began to tell them a story. He sees people who identify themselves by the stories they're handed. You see that? Not as a person that collects taxes. He is a tax collector. Not just somebody that sins. They are sinners. Not just folks who believe in a certain religion. They are Pharisees. They identify as the stories that they're handed. And Jesus says, well, let me give you a different story. If that art shaped your perspective and gave you an identity, let me give you a different one. And begins to tell all the same story in a bunch of different ways. He says there's a lost sheep. A shepherd goes and finds it, leaves the 99 for it. He comes back, turns up, and celebrates. It's a lost coin. Something valuable is lost. Lady starts sweeping the house so she finds it. Lights all the lamps. Calls her friends when she finds it. Says, let's celebrate. Let's turn up together. Because that which is lost is found. Tells the same story about some sons. We're so weird in our religious lenses of things. We typically call this the prodigal son story. The word prodigal doesn't show up anywhere in the story at all. It's the same story. Lost sheep, lost coins, lost sons. He says the same thing happens. It's a son that's lost. And the father is eager for that son to come home. For him to see himself as he actually is. When he comes home, he celebrates. He kills a cow. They have fajitas that night. It's a good time. And as they celebrate, he says, this son of mine was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. This is the refrain over and over again. This is the story that he's telling. That the lost is found. That which the Lord wants is found. The masterpiece is whole because the missing piece is restored. Part of what we have to accept in this is that it's calling out the ways that we are not perfect. We're not found already. We're not completely there. Scripture says some crazy things about you. It calls you a saint. You and I both know you ain't always a saint. It calls you perfect, spotless without blemish. And you're like, I got some blemishes, Jesus. Made in the image of God. A co-heir with Christ. A work of art, a poema, Ephesians 2 says. All that's beautiful, but at the same time, I'm not there yet. And, And that's a big deal to acknowledge that I need to be reconciled to that. I don't always like somebody pointing out where I'm not there yet. 
My wife and I, we, we met, thanks for stalking that. My wife and I met in seventh grade. Um, and like, I knew, like, I was like, yo, sh this, she a baddie. Like, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get booed up real quick. So I knew, I knew she was special from the jump, right? Like, I, I wanted to, you know, get in a relationship with her. We started dating. It took, took her some time to be as convinced about me. So we started dating in 11th grade. And I'm doing everything I can to impress this girl, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm writing poetry because she likes art. Uh, I, I, I get a growth spurt because she likes tall people. I'm doing everything I can <laughs> to just be convincing. Like, give your boy a shot, right? And so eventually, uh, I, I recognize her father's a minister of music. And so I'm like, yo, I'm going to learn music for her, right? I already kind of hear music a little bit. I'm going to learn piano. And so I, I learned, this is before YouTube, so it's kind of hard. I'm listening to the songs, learning how to play them. I have an ear for it, but I'm not formally trained. So I'm pretty good on the piano. Only problem is I don't know how to play it the right way. Because these fingers don't move well, so I'm playing with these two fingers right here. That's all I got. Like a T-Rex just going. <laughs> and I was bad with these little three joints. I was getting it in, you know what I mean? And so I'm playing, and she was like, oh, you like, you, you, you like music now? I'm like, yeah, girl, I love music. It's great. She was like, you're getting really, really good at that. I'm like, girl, stop. I'm doing all right. I'm do what I can. And she's like really getting impressed, right? And she's like stroking my ego, like, you have a gift. I'm like, girl. She's like... You're really getting the hang of that, thanks. And then she says, I think you should take some lessons. Whoa, hold on. I like it this way. This is my style. Like, just tell me I'm good. Don't tell me I have work to do. Tell me I'm, I'm great. She said, no, I see something in you. I think you can really go somewhere with this. You should try to take some lessons. And as, as, as much as I just wanted to be true, like, I'm already good, I'm already gifted, just tell me I'm awesome, she was right. There are some things I felt musically that I did not know how to express. Similarly, there are things that God calls you. You have been given an identity from Jesus. But it takes work to build that character. So God calls you a son. God calls you an heir, calls you a masterpiece, calls you a friend. And right now you may feel that, but there's, there's a way in which he's inviting us to learn, to grow and mature in that. God says things about the church that we want to be true calls it a, a, a light that you can't hide. Put it on a hill. Calls it his bride. Calls it his body. We have to be honest that a church is not that. It needs to be reconciled to God. I joined a staff at church, and it was an amazing place. But again, it was a weird time. I, I started working at the church during COVID, and so we weren't in person. I had a pastor when I first came on staff. He was like, hey, uh, you're coming here. I moved there March 22nd. So we'd had two online services. Great pastor. He was like, I want you to know that we're going to do a couple more of these online services, and then you're going to be in the building probably by like the end of April. I was like, wow, that's great. Great pastor. Terrible prophet. Didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> no idea. And so that whole first year, we were just in the house. And you guys remember what that year was. It was one story after another. It was one video surfacing after another. There were certain names that got popular to say. But there were way more names that we did not talk about. Years of names that we didn't talk about. So we saw some brokenness that the church was just silent on. One of the things that, that, that Jesus says about his church, it, it'll be a house of prayer. More often than not, it was a house of debate or a house of silence. Or a house that didn't know how to navigate it, so it just propped up a couple of black folks to have the conversations. And this is not just true in the black community. There's so many ways in which God wants his church to be a light, to be an example, to be a body that we don't know how to be. Reconciliation is us recognizing that we're not there yet, but God desperately hopes that we would be. And the space between where we are and where God desires for us to be what we would call biblically lament. We cry out to God and say, how long, Lord? Say, we turn away, Lord. We're sorry, Lord. We confess, Lord. We are not those people. We have not heard the cries of the needy. We have not sought your love. We have not been just like we ought to be. The beauty of art, scripture, is it shows us over and over and over again is that God hears those prayers and he responds by shaping us, by making us the art. By saying, you recognize you're not this, but you know I'm going to make you this. Allow me to shape you. I'm going to move you a certain way. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to show you guys a picture.
picture is called Immersion. It's uh, by a guy named Andres Serrano, taken in 1987. Again, arts communities don't always love Jesus. And so this is a, uh, a crucifix submerged in a jar of urine and blood, which is ill. And so you see this picture, and in the arts community, it was like, oh, yeah, we love that super punk rock. Forget Jesus. Put him in the blood and in the, in the pee and stuff. And the church community was like, what in the world are you doing? How could you defile the beauty of God's image, the beauty of God's crucifixion, the work that he's up to in the world, and submerging a defiling agent? This picture made a lot of waves at the time. Interestingly enough, uh, Andres was actually a follower of Jesus. And what he was doing here is he was challenging some of our assumptions. He was challenging the lens that we see things through. Love and art does this. It starts to mess with you and help you realize, oh, man, I'm, I've been a fish this entire time. Oh, this is water. It's challenging how you see stuff. What he's trying to get at here is that we tend to think that holiness is about cleanliness, and in some biblical terms it is. But he makes the case that we believe that the defiling agent of the blood and the urine would change the cross, not the power of the cross would change the defiling agent. He's challenging our assumption as to what we think is more powerful, sin or God's holiness. What's more powerful, culture or the heart of the Father? What's more powerful, those communities that you think are far from God's reach or God's desire for those communities? What's more potent, the broken narratives that were handed from our culture or the story of the gospel? What will do the greater work, our own desire for justice or the presence of God alive among us, shaping how we move? I've been praying for this campus. One of my prayers is that God would do a work like this, that he would, he would take his holiness and it would go places where we think it should not go, mess with stuff we think it shouldn't mess with. Challenge our assumptions, because a lot of times we think God go to them. Challenge our assumptions, Jesus. Shape in us some of the places that are broken, the lenses that we see through. I'm hopeful for tonight, tonight we get to share a bunch of poems and whatever you guys want to bring as well. And this is the whole thing I'm going to be doing, just challenging assumptions, saying a bunch of quasi-cool art um, in the hope that it challenges how we see things. Hot take. Jesus is way more conservative than you are, way more progressive than you are. He's way more for those people you're against and way more for you and the people you side with than you are. I think he wants to challenge that assumption. He's more for justice than you are. He's more for mercy than you are. He's actively working this. We pray, Lord, you give us eyes to see it. Lord Jesus, would you bless the rest of our time here? Help us to see where you are doing an atoning work. Help us to see your hand and your fingerprints over the masterpiece. Help us to see you active on this campus today. I pray for revival and awakening. I pray for a stirring. I pray for a challenging of assumption. And in all that, we pray you help us to find ourselves in that story, in that work. Make us, make us a canvas. Make us a journal entry. Make us a sculpture. Make us a jar of a weird crucifix and some weird stuff. That would, that would begin to represent you to the world and reconcile people's visions to how you have a heart for them. You are a loving father that desires to have sons and daughters come home. Let it be so here on this campus, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lo. You have given us all so much to think about. This morning's session is only one part of the Day of Common Learning. This afternoon, we have various sessions hosted by faculty to consider how theater, paintings, and narratives and stories can help us reconcile with each other and with God. Please note that the program that you have was printed um, and 
since that time, we've had a few sessions change, so please check the QR code to verify the session's offerings and where those sessions will be. And then this evening at 7 o'clock in Upper Gwynn, Lowe will be sharing at the open mic night, and students as well will have an opportunity to interact and share their thoughts and ideas. I encourage you to take advantage of the various offerings during this day and evening. And additionally, you may want to, okay, save the date of March 9th, as Lowe will be back in Seattle for a night of visual art and poetry. As we end our session this morning, I'd just like to ask our interim president, Pete Minharis, to share a closing prayer. Lo, thank you again. That was wonderful. And um, as we close, it's so important to understand how the arts can unite us, how the arts can lift us, how the arts can bless us in so many ways. And I'm looking forward to this afternoon and to the sessions that will be offered. And I just ask that you would be open to how God would be speaking to you and how he wants to draw you closer to him. And so if you would, please stand with me as I close our, our time with a word of prayer. And we will be dismissed as soon as I give the amen. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you this morning for our speaker. We thank you for his life, for his story, his journey, his perspective, his lens. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder that the point of the biblical story is communion. Communion with God, communion with one another. And Lord, we thank you for the gift and for the hope of reconciliation. We ask that through the arts, somehow, some way, this day, you draw us closer to you and to one another. We are your handiwork. We are your poema. We are your creative expression. And I ask that you would allow us to see ourselves through your lens, to see us exactly how Jesus sees us. And so, Lord, we commit the rest of this day to you as we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You may be dismissed.